our Wednesday night Bible studies are, are going fantastic. I am thoroughly enjoying dissecting what we believe. And we've gone through the Bible. We've gone through God. We've gone through Jesus. This week, if you could guess, we're going to go finish the Trinity and talk about the Spirit. So if you could come at 6 o'clock on Wednesday nights and, and we, we get deep into Scripture and, and pointing out where we believe and what we believe about the topic of that, that evening. So if you're interested in finding out what we believe about the Holy Spirit, come on uh, Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Uh, movie and nachos, that's coming up on October 11th. Uh, Jesus Revolution is the movie we're watching. Uh, invite your friends to this. This is a, a fantastic time to have, have a supper together and then watch a movie that will share the gospel with them as well. Um, yeah. Uh, and then coming up, you can see here the, the rest of, of the announcements. Uh, the Ellis family and Esther Clement are going to be coming in October on back-to-back -back weeks. I'm excited to meet them for the first time and, and hear what God's doing them and, and, and their missionary stories. So, so uh, put that in your calendar. Make sure that, that you're prepared and, and ready to do that. Uh, James Ellis has asked to take over Sunday school as well. So he's got a lot to say, and, and he's excited to be here and see all of us again. Yeah, that's it. Let's worship. I'm excited. Father, we love you so much. Father, you are good. That is a, a theme in my prayers this week. You are good. Father, we can trust you to be good day after day, day after day, day after day. And Father, because you are good, you are worthy of our worship, and that's what we do with you today. We worship you. Father, close off the distractions from our hearts, from our minds, from our thoughts. Help us to focus on how good you are. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. I'm just um, encouraged by our congregation and how they come together and pray for these needs, and it's evident. And those that are needing the prayers, they, they feel the prayers that are, are being shown or uh, prayed on their behalf. I run across this this morning. Um, prayer is powerful. Prayer makes a difference. God's power is seen when his people join together in prayer for one another. God hears the prayers of his people, and he has the power to work mightily in any given situation. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 tells us, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Choose to step outside your comfort zone and pray for the needs that you see before you. Right there and then, let prayer be the gift you give to a friend by helping bear their burden and directing them before God's throne. So I invite you now to stand as we begin with Come, now is the time to worship.
we also ask that you would be as our pastor today. That you'd strengthen him. That you'd give him the courage, as you did Paul, to speak these words. That you give the pastor the courage to speak the words that you've given him to teach us today. We also ask that you continue to be with his family, that they would be able to support him, encourage him, and give him direction in his life through the many things that kids and wives do. And Lord, we think of the many things that we enjoy, including this fellowship, and we ask that you'd allow us to continue to pray for Paul and his family, among the other things that go on. But we think of the many blessings that we have, how nice it is to live where we live. Sun comes up in the morning, we're not afraid that somebody's going to break into our house and steal things or kill us. You've blessed us, Lord, richly. We ask for that continued protection and guidance in our lives that we might keep it. And as the ushers come forward, Lord, we think of finances. Dollars are short, can be. But we ask that you would continue to allow us to support this church in the ways that you would have us to do it. And allow us to be joyful in doing that. But we know that it is for our benefit, not for yours, that we do this. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, church family. I opened up my Bible this morning and, and I ripped out a page. And that makes me sad because it's Ephesians, it's right where we're at. So it's, I have to be a little more careful with that, I guess. So we live in a world of rivalries, don't we? The, the, the world we live in, there are rivalries all around us. In high school, I went to a, a school called Faith Christian High School in, in, in Arvada, Colorado, and our biggest rival was a school called Holy Family, and it was a Catholic school 
in Broomfield, Colorado. We didn't like them at all, and they didn't like us. It was a mutual hatred of one another, a rivalry to its deepest core. It didn't matter what we were playing, was it basketball or football, soccer, uh, anything that, that we, we played, it was a rivalry. And, it, and we always had a great turnout for these events that we called the Holy War. We had Christians versus the Catholics, the Holy War. During my time on the basketball team, we didn't lose to Holy Family once. We, we stopped them pretty good every year. And, and our class actually held the longest uh, winning streak against Holy Family in the history of that rivalry. My, my school has since closed down, so we get to hold that title forever, which I'm excited about. But, but after I graduated high school, my folks moved pretty close to where Holy Family is located. And, and that's before they moved out to Ohio. And, 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 and still to this day, when I drove by that school, I got remembered, reminded of that rivalry that I had, so much so that I would roll down the windows and boo out the window, and, and Karen hated that. <laughs> Probably because there's people walking, yeah. We live in a world of rivalries, don't we? Some of us have a, a friendly rivalry between Android phones and, and Apple phones. Some of us have rivalries between PC and, and Apple products, Macs. We all have the rivalry of which one is better, Coke or Pepsi, and the right answer is Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Some uh, sports are, are full of rivalries. The, the Broncos have lost something like nine straight games to the Las Vegas Raiders, and, and that hurts me to my soul at times because I don't like the Raiders. I called my dad. They, they lost again just a few weeks ago to the Raiders, and I called my dad, and I said, I just want to stop losing to the Raiders. We can lose every other game except to the Raiders. We've got to stop this. Rivalries are, are, are part of what makes sports fun to watch, but then we also have some not-so-fun rivalries. There are political rivalries, Republican and Democrat. We, we have historical rivalries between the North and the South, and then there are rivalries that have turned violent, rivalries uh, with people who kill each other based on gang affiliation and, and cultural differences and, and even racial hostilities. Those types of rivalries happen across the world still. And they've been happening for a long time, even back to when Paul was writing the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Paul touches on the deep, complex, hostile rivalry between the Jews and the Gentiles. In case you may not know, Gentiles are, are simply just non-Jews. We, as, as non-Jewish people here, are all Gentiles. And in verse 11, Paul uses the word ethna, which is uh, where we get our word ethnicity. So, so Gentiles are all other ethnicities except for the Jews. And as we've seen in Scripture over and over again, the, the Jews and the Gentiles, they didn't like each other. There is a, a fierce rivalry between the two groups. Primarily, it was a religious rivalry. The, the Gentiles didn't know the God of Israel but it was also a, a cultural and, and uh, racial rivalry as well. Culturally, the Jews had rituals and feasts and, and traditions and ceremonies that, that distinguished them separate from the Gentiles. And racially, the, the Jews uh, were proud because their bloodline was that of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which, which made them separate from the Gentiles. But yet, through Christ, as we've read so far in Ephesians, and as we'll continue to read today, these two generational enemies are now becoming friends. And we're going to see that Jesus accomplished this peacemaking through his sacrificial death. Not only was there a vertical aspect to, uh, behind the, the death of Christ that, that unites us to God, but there's also this horizontal aspect and, and purpose behind Christ's death 
that unites us with one another. We, we all have been reconciled to God. We've been reconciled to others. And because of that, we are what we know as the church. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 is perhaps the single most important eschatological text in Scripture. The ecclesiastical, uh, that, that word is just the study of the church. Essentially, it's, it's what makes the church the church. And we'll see in this passage that we have an answer to that question. And the beautiful thing about what we're about to read today is, is as we study about the importance of the church, it's not about decorations. It's not about the, the, the programs or, or the, the, the versions of the Bible, the types of Bible studies that we have. It's not about the translation of the Bible that we use, but it's simply about the work of Christ on the cross. That's the, the center of what Paul uses as he studies the church in this passage. Verses 13 through 18 are, are sandwiched between who the Gentiles were and who have they become. And, and, and right in the middle of this passage is a description of the cross. And, and Paul uses phrases like blood of the Messiah in the flesh through the cross. You see, it, it's through the cross that we have become, uh, that, that our alienation from God has ceased to exist. So if you haven't already, grab a Bible, turn them on. We'll be in Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. And we'll start reading after we pray. God, I thank you for your word. Father, we expect when we open your word to learn more about you. You have told us that that's what we can expect. So, Father, do that this morning. Teach us about who you are and what you've done for us. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. So Paul starts off by urging the Gentiles to remember who they were and who they become so that they could have this greater sense of, of gratitude towards God and, and a greater love for one another as members of the church. He's pointing back to the lesson from, from the first half of Ephesians 2 that, that we looked at last week. He's drawing conclusions of that vertical change that we looked at, and, and he uses that to support this horizontal change that we're going to see today. So verse 11 starts off with this. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though... It affected only their bodies and not their hearts. So we're going to stop there, and I, I know that's just verse 11, but, but the first two verses of this passage today, 11 and 12, they follow a very similar pattern to the verses in, in 1 through 3 that we read last week. They paint this dark picture of, of life apart from Christ. In short, they were, and, and we were, similarly alienated from God and from God's people. And Paul addresses the readers by saying, you Gentiles used to be outsiders. He, he highlights this, this real physical difference between the Gentiles and the Jews. And, and this physical difference that Paul is referencing is circumcision. He says, you were called uncircumcised heathens. The, the Jews dismissed the rest of the world because of their uncircumcision. Not because they were the only ones who practiced it, but because their circumcision was a sign that, that they had this covenant with the Lord. To be uncircumcised meant that you were separated from that covenant. It means that you were separated from God. But Paul throws this little jab in there. He says that they were proud of their circumcision. They knew that their circumcision was, was good, and, and it made them a little more special. And they flaunted it, not literally, but, but they, they did brag and, and boast about their circumcision over the Gentiles. 
But then he says, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. That, sh- that would have made them kind of tense up a little bit. Galatians chapter 6, verse 15 says, it doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. In verse 12, Paul points out and and elaborates on their pre-Christian past. It says, in those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. So the first thing that that Paul points out here in their pre-Christian past, he says that they were Christless. They were living apart from Christ. Up until this point in history, the the Gentiles, all the non-Jews were were separated from that messianic hope that Israel had. The Jews were chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. And it's worth noting here that, that, that Jews were and still are separated from Christ. Even though they were told about the Messiah in Scripture, we still have some Jews, many Jews, who are separated from Christ. But for the Gentiles, on the other hand, this was all new. They hadn't had the scriptures before. They were foreigners to these things. Paul says they were excluded from citizenship of Israel, and as a result, they were strangers to the covenants that had been made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Israel was this nation under God, but, but, but the Gentiles, apart from God, were, were apart from God's covenants, and they were foreigners. And that term covenant promises that we see here in verse 12, it implies this series of covenants, all of the covenants referencing back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, and David. They didn't know any of these things. They were foreigners to those concepts. And again, to be separated from the covenant promises meant that they were a people without hope of the promised Messiah. The Gentiles were Christless, they were foreigners, and they were hopeless. They were hopeless and godless, Paul says. While God did plan to bless all the nations through Israel, the Gentiles hadn't known that fact until Jesus came. And because they didn't know these promises, they, they, they didn't have the hope of those promises. Nor do they know the God of those promises. Instead, they opted for their own false gods instead of the one true God, the, the God of hope. Before we trusted Christ... Before we accepted God's free gift of salvation in our own lives, we were in that exact same predicament. And it's a tragic position to be in. We were separated from God and his people. And Paul started off verse 11 with this idea to to not forget, he says. Don't forget. And that's an encouragement for us too. We, We too need to remember this fact You and I at one time were separated from Christ and his gospel and and the community that comes with knowing Christ. We can't forget that. Instead, we need to live a life of constant gratitude towards God and a love for his people. Now, if you would, please quickly glance up to chapter 2, verse 4. Two of the most beautiful words in the scripture, but God, right? Verse 13 is, is another one of these but statements. Verse 13 says, but now you have been united 
with Christ. You were Christless. You were foreigners. You were godless and hopeless. But now you've been united with Christ. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Do you see this drastic change that has occurred? By the blood of Christ, we Gentiles have been brought near to God. It's only because of of Christ's blood, his, his death on the cross, that we've been reconciled to God. So do you see how how Christ's work on the cross is essential to the church. It has to be essential to the church. He died on our behalf, taking God's punishment on our behalf. He did so so that we can experience this union both with God, but but also with others. And I believe that, that understanding this importance of the cross being central to who we are as Christians and in the church is, is a necessary thing that we have to know. Sadly, though, there are some Christians who don't like the blood language that, that happens in the Bible. Some believers, uh, they, they think the cross is, is almost overemphasized in the teaching of the church. Others believe that the cross is too violent to focus on as much as we do. And perhaps the most unfortunate thing that I read this week, that there are some believers who believe that the cross is irrelevant to the church, claiming that it has nothing to offer the church and the modern day believers. And when I read that this, this, this week, my first reaction was, excuse me? Are, are you kidding? The cross doesn't have just a little to offer. The cross is, is everything. The cross has everything to offer us, folks. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, I passed on to you what was most important. So what was most important? Christ died for our sins, just as Scripture said. He was buried and he was raised on the cross uh, from the dead on the third day, just as Scripture said. According to Paul, the the cross was the main thing that we have to offer the world. It's everything that we have. After saying that that Christ's death has brought us near, in verse 12, Paul, uh, sorry, 13, Paul goes on to add... uh, more results of Christ's sacrifice. And I want you to notice that this next bit of of passage that we read here, it it changes from you, you, you to we and us. Both Jews and Gentiles here have the same hope in Christ's atoning death. So look at verse 14 and, and, and see if you could point out four things that the Savior has done for us through his work on the cross. It says, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. The first thing to note here is that Jesus has brought us peace with God and with others. Jesus is our peacemaker. Paul says Christ himself brought peace to us. This peace is is the true everlasting peace that is only found in Jesus. Apart from Jesus and without the work of Jesus on the cross, you and I can never experience true peace. Is your life chaotic right now? Are your relationships strained? 
work out of control always, right? Is your health failing you? Run to Christ and find peace that only he can give you. Secondly, Jesus has made us one. Paul says he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Christ's blood has completely obliterated the old long-standing division between the Jews and the Gentiles. When Paul wrote this letter, there was a literal wall that was standing in the temple, and it had the purpose of excluding the Gentiles from the temple. And along this wall, every few feet you would go, there would be a sign that said, Gentiles stay out for fear of death. They couldn't enter the, the, the temple unless they wanted to fear death. Isn't that incredible? So while Paul could have been referencing this literal wall in the temple, it seems more likely that he was referencing this barrier of the system of law with its commandments and regulations. That It was a ceremonial wall. The passage uh, that parallels this one in Colossians 2 alludes to circumcision and questions about food and drink and, and the regulations about festivals and, and the regulations about Sabbath, and it goes on. The, the Old Testament had commandments for all of these regulations, and, and they put this huge metaphorical wall between the Jews and the Gentiles that the Gentiles couldn't fulfill. And thus, they weren't allowed in the temple. But what Paul is saying here is that, that Jesus has set all of those commandments and regulations aside when he died on the cross. Jesus fulfilled all of those, those ceremonial type systems. And as a result, Paul says Christ made peace between the Jews and the Gentiles by creating in himself one new person from the two groups. Jesus' tearing down and, and fulfilling of this old system led to the creation of, of something new, a, a new people. And it's in Christ, in Christ alone, that this new people exist. In Christ, a, a new corporate entity exists, and we call that the church. It's not as though Gentiles have been transformed into Jews or, or Jews into Gentiles, but God said he created one new people. Our identity has completely changed in Christ. And Paul elaborates on this in verse 16. He says, together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility towards each other was put to death. Paul speaks of this reconciliation that has taken place, stating that, that hostility has been put to death. One of the commentators that I read, he, he wrote, God turned away his own wrath, wrath, and we, having seen this great love, should also turn away our wrath. Christ's death on the cross ended the hostility that we have towards others. And consequently, as, as Christians, we should be a people who forgive one another because of the forgiveness that was given to us by Christ. And that makes me think of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, right? Forgive our debts as we forgive those who have debted us. When, when queer, Christians quarrel with each other, and, and that's no being here because we're perfect, right? But when Christians quarrel with each other, we need to pause. We need to think about the forgiveness that, that God has given us through Christ, through the work of Christ on the cross. And when we do that, we should be able to experience God's peace because the cross of Christ is how peace was achieved and how it was extended forgiveness to others. And since that peace has been achieved, it must also be preached. Jesus preached peace. 
Look at verse 17. It says, he brought this good news of peace. There we go. To you Gentiles who are far away from him. And peace to the Jews who were near. Jesus proclaimed this gospel of of peace before the cross. He, He proclaimed it on the cross and after the resurrection. And we must now be ready to preach the gospel of peace. We need to tell the world about the peace that it could have with God. Because our world is hurting, isn't it? Because of the the lack of true, genuine peace that that only God could bring to us, our world hurts. They're searching for peace everywhere. They're hoping that religion or or spirituality will help them. They they, they think maybe money, more money, more money, or, or if I work harder, then I'll find peace. They say, maybe I'll bury myself into a hundred different relationships or, or into substances, and, and maybe in there I'll find peace. Everyone wants peace, but, but I don't think there's, there's a, a mentally stable person in this world who would only say, I don't want peace. I, I like living in chaos. I, I never want to find peace. That, that person doesn't exist. So we need to tell the world how they could have peace through God, by the Holy Spirit. Christ proclaims his peace through the ordinary people like us. The world wants peace, and the only way that they're going to find it is when believers like you and me faithfully preach the gospel of peace that Christ also preached. Jesus brought peace. Jesus made us one. Jesus preached peace. And Jesus has also given us access to God. Those who responded to Jesus' work on the cross now have access to God. Look at verse 18. Now all of us could come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. This is what prayer is all about, right? Prayer is a conversation between the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit. And one of the benefits of of Christ's work on the cross is this ongoing, direct, personal access that we all have to God. You know, this idea of having direct access to God through prayer, it's, it's something that I've always known as a child, yet it still puzzles me, and, I, and I, it still blows my mind. I, I, I wrestle with this thought daily. And I don't mean that I, I don't believe that it's true, but, but I, don't, like, I don't believe that, that God would allow me to have this type of access. Does that make sense? I don't believe it, but, but I believe it at the same time. Like, how do I have this access to God? How does someone like me, someone who is so undeserving, who is so broken, who is someone who has messed up so much in my life, why would God allow me to have that type of access? And even though I don't understand how God could love me that much, I know that to be true. And I trust that he loves me, and that's why I get that access. I never want to take that for granted. However, Paul isn't just emphasizing personal privilege. He uses us language in verse 18, doesn't he? Paul is emphasizing that Jews and Gentiles together, as one body, can approach God through Christ by the Spirit. We live out our our new positions in Christ, the the new creations that he has created us to be in our community by the Spirit of God. Isn't that amazing? We corporately have access to God when we gather together. Look at 
let's read to the end of the chapter. Paul summarizes Christ's work on the cross by reminding the Gentiles of who they were and who they are now. He says, they've been joined together with Jewish believers and they now belong to this new community, starting in verse 19. He says, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers or foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. So in Ephesians 2, 5, and 6 last week, we looked at, at the Greek word synergirin, if you remember that word. Uh, and we get our English word from that word synchronized. Paul was, was saying how uh, we were synced with Christ in his resurrection, right? Well, here in, in these verses 19 through 22, we, we have three more instances where the root of that word appears again, and it's, it's referencing how we have become saint with other believers. This is our, di- our, our identity. Paul says we are citizens along with God's holy people. We are members of God's family, and we are joined together as God's dwelling place. So let's look at each of those this morning. First, Paul says that we are no longer strangers and foreigners and, and now live uh, as citizens of kingdom, uh, citizens of God's kingdom. He, he says that we have citizenship in God's kingdom. Gentiles are no longer second-class citizens. They are full-blown members of God's kingdom. During this time, Roman citizenship was, was a prized treasure because it came with wonderful benefits and and privileges of being a Roman citizen. Using this language in in Ephesus, in this letter to Ephesus, uh, which was the the cultural capital of the Roman Empire at the time, it would have meant a lot to these people as they read this. And what Paul is saying here is this, we belong. We are citizens of God's kingdom. We are united together. We are part of the kingdom that has no end. And then Paul uses a metaphor for God's new community, and it's a little more personal. He says that we are members of God's family. The, the citizenship would have been a difficult pill to swallow for both of the groups. But then when Paul says that, uh, that the Jews and the Gentiles we're now part of the same family. That would have been utterly absurd to most of these people. They didn't like each other. They thought maybe we could live together, but, but as a family? So how are we family? We have the same father. The same father that we all have access to has made us a family. In chapter 1, Paul wrote that God adopted us into his own family. We have been adopted as children into God's family. The the, the church, our church is made up of brothers and sisters in God's family. We are a family, and that means that we have responsibilities in the family to fulfill our roles and to bring glory to God, the Father. And we're going to look at that when we get later on in Ephesians. But what I want you to see, and, and, and what I'm really trying to, to drive home with this point, and, and, I, and I've said this many times in the last several years, but, but I want you to see that the church is not a building that we go to. It's not an event that we attend weekly. The church, according to Paul in the book of Ephesians, is a family. We are a family, and, and, and as, as Gordon said this morning, This family, this smaller portion of of the overall family of God is a very prayerful family. I'm thankful for that. 
We live life together on mission to glorify God. That's what a family does. And we need to be careful not to treat the church as a hotel, a place that we visit occasionally to get rest and tip if we're served well. Rather, my desire is that that we all see the church as a part of our Christian identity and that, that we understand that we all have roles to play in God's household. And there's a, a special call here to, to parents and grandparents as well. The, the, this is a great lesson to teach our children through our example. As parents and, and grandparents, if we place a high value on, on being the church and, and loving and praying and serving the church, then our children are going to see that. Likewise, if we don't place value on the church, they're going to see that too. The third metaphor that Paul uses when, uh, when, when talking about our new identity here would have also been very vivid for his audience. We are stones in God's temple. Paul says we are his house joined together, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. For nearly a thousand years, the, the temple has been a, a, a major focal point in Israel. From Solomon to Zerubbabel to Herod, the, the temple is the big thing, right? But now Paul is saying there's a new temple. A temple that is made up of the people. In verse 20, Paul says that the foundation of the temple was God's word, that the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. And this makes sense for us, right? That the emphasis on God's word here as the foundation of the temple shouldn't surprise us. We, that the church, we will stand or fall based on our faithfulness to God's word. If we don't have that foundation laid in God's word, we're a house built on sand. We are a house built on sand, in the sand hills. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says that the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. And Acts 17 commends the the church in Berea for searching the scriptures day after day to make sure of what the apostles said were facts. Shout out to being good Bereans. God's word must be foundational in our church life. But then we also see that the cornerstone of this temple is Christ Jesus himself. He is what makes the entire building possible. The whole community that is the church is built on him. He provides security and structure for the building. He gives it alignment. God's word is emphasized and is important. And Jesus' work and person are also emphasized. And in that, in those truths, in those foundations, in the cornerstone, the church grows and is held together. Because there is no unity or growth in the church if not for the foundation and the cornerstone. If Christ is not the center of the church, we don't have a church. We have a club. And then Paul likens the people to the stones, carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. We are carefully joined together. Not one of us in here are here by accident. God has placed us here together as his church custom built, not for our own glory, not for for brand recognition of the church, but to become a holy, united temple of the Lord. Think about that for a second. Before, the, the, the Gentiles weren't even allowed to enter the temple. They had no business there. They would be killed had they entered the temple 
where the Lord dwelled. And now Paul says, not only are they allowed in, but they are part of the structure. Through Christ, by the Spirit of God, God dwells in us personally and as a community. And ultimately this reality will be fully realized and enjoyed when the new heavens and the new earth comes. I'm excited for that time. So my favorite question is, so what? I'm going to point out a few final applications from this passage. An obvious application, uh, implication from the three metaphors that Paul uses near the end of this passage is that Christ wants to create this singular people, not merely isolated individuals who come together every now and then and believe in him. When I read this passage, I can't help but, but think of this idea of individualism that has nestled its way into our American culture. We love being individuals. We're, we're proud of our individualism. Look at, look at what I can do all by myself. My, my little girl says that all the time. I did this by myself, Daddy. But it can't be that way in the church. The church can't be made up of a bunch of individual family members. To separate from the church and to say, I want to be a stone apart from a building, or I want to be a, a son or a daughter separated from my family. And too many Christians treat the church as something that's unnecessary, unimportant, and even a hindrance to the great things that they think they could do for God. Some think that church is fine for others, but, but they don't feel the need to take membership seriously or that they could do things better on their own. But the New Testament positions the church as our fundamental identity in Christ. Belonging to a local church should be more important than anything else. Where we go to school, where, where we go to work, the, the clubs that we belong to, and, and, and what cheer, teams we cheer for, what, what trucks we drive, any of that is secondary, third, fourth, way down the list compared to our fundamental identity as the church. If we're apart from community, if we de-emphasize the importance of belonging to a church, then we're not following the, the New Testament pattern for what God has set out for our lives. It's not a good thing to be apart from the oversight of shepherds or apart from the accountability and support that we give each other at brothers and sisters. When you read through the New Testament, there's an assumption that, that is made of every believer in the New Testament. It, it assumes that every Christian is a part of a local church. There is no Lone Ranger exception in Scripture. We need to live out our spiritual union with Christ visibly. And we need to live out our union with others visibly. We need to identify ourselves not as a Christian, but as the church. Avoid being a ninja Christian, as one of my commentaries writes. Avoid being a ninja Christian, slipping in and out of a worship service without a trace. Now, Scripture clearly allows flexibility as to how to work out membership in a local church. And personally, I, I struggle with the idea of membership. When I think of membership, I think of Sam's Club. I'm able to pay my dues and, and go get the benefits of Sam's Club without ever having to put any effort into it. I don't have to work at the store. I could just show up as I please, take what I need, pay my dues, and be good. 
Unfortunately, that's been the mindset of many Christians within the church over the last couple centuries. Instead, we should think of it as a partnership. When a, when a law firm opens up, they don't have members, they have partners. They have people who have committed physically and monetarily to the success of the firm. They have an initial buy-in. They have to put a leg into the race so that they work hard to support and encourage the success of that firm. Christians, we need to buy into the church. to the teaching and the serving and the, the leading and the growing and the spreading of the gospel and the training of disciples so that we work hard to support and encourage success, not for ourselves, but for the glory of God. So regardless of membership or, or partnership, whatever, the, the, the New Testament emphasizes the importance of belonging to the church, and it's abundantly clear, especially in this passage. We cannot honestly read this passage today without seeing that importance of the church. God has intended us to live out our faith and love for one another in community. It's an incredible gift from God. It's an incredible gift of God's grace to have a family of faith. It is a gift to gather corporately and stir up one another to do faith and good works. It is a gift of grace to love one another as Christ loved us. It is a gift to carry one another's burdens. It is a gift, to, a gift of grace to be taught and admonished by one another. It is a gift to be allowed the privilege of giving financially to further the gospel. It is a gift of grace to come to the table for communion. All of these privileges are, are part of what being the church means. And we have these privileges because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He has brought us near and he has made us one. Let's pray. God, clearly, you value the church. You have set it up. You have created it. You have told us how we should act with one another, how we should behave, how we should treat, how we should love and serve each other. Father, help this truth to sink into our hearts this week, the truth that the church is important. not to keep a building afloat, but to share the gospel to the world. We thank you for today, Father God. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Rejoin us in singing, There is a Redeemer.